I'm just gonna call her out. <laughs> She, so Andrea is actually a master gardener who is transferring from Georgia, and she, we, yeah, we found a spot. <laughs> um, we have another transfer from South Carolina over here, so you guys can like share war stories. Um, but so uh, Andrea was traveling when we started the class and thought she'd be back in a minute. It took her two minutes, but she's been following along with everything online, taking all the quizzes, watching all the recordings, and so she is with us now and. She's part of the class, and we'll get her official name tag. But um, so, just everyone, take a chance to welcome Andrea today at the break. Um, so that's our first big one. And the, yeah, so and then as a reminder for this afternoon, we will be out at Briggs from 2:30 to 4:30. Um, Briggs, many of you have already been there, but the easiest way to find it, if you haven't been there already, is actually just to look for East Coast Metal Distributors in your phone. Um, it's better than the address we give you. <laughs> it is legitimately across from East Coast Metal Distributors. The address is a little bit finicky. You can park on the street. That's all totally fine. Sherilyn will be your fearless guide for that. Um, and I want to mention that I will not be able to make it this afternoon for that. But Sherilyn, you, are, you guys know, you're in more than capable hands. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> you will all love it. So. Today we are also starting a short portion at the beginning of class where we have um, heads or chairs of our various committees come in so that they can introduce what the committees do so you can learn about some different volunteer opportunities. So today we are going to start with um, the social committee and the field trip committee and so I will give the floor over to Mary Hanlon of social committee first. <laughs> share drinks um, and 
this committee has been fairly inactive since COVID, of course, because we haven't been planning these kind of get-togethers. So I'm just going to show a couple pictures here of things we've done in the past and we hope to do in the near future, hopefully next year. Um, okay, so this picture here shows an example of a holiday party that we had at an event like this. This was held at a, at a venue called the Hill House. Um, Master gardeners brought food, brought drink, um, and we just had a nice dinner and uh, had a chance to mingle and uh, socialize. Okay, so what I want to plan up, uh, point out here, you can't see my face, you probably can't see this too well either, but Mary Hanlon, this is me. <laughs> Claudia Crassmiller is the other head of this committee. Um, Margaret Lee is one of the best contributors to this committee because she loves to bake and just bring all kinds of food to events like this. Um, anyway, th that was 2019, I think. It was a while. It was just before the pandemic. Okay. Um, some people like to bring fancy food. Um, so those are a couple examples. Now, if I could find, there are just a couple other examples on here somewhere. Well, shoot. Okay, here's another. <laughs> Sorry, I'm hopeless on this computer at the moment. I guess. You and Mary, and just tell me what you want. Oh, okay. I was just trying to go to another set of pictures. No, you guys. Okay. Sushi Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is one of our members, Taka. Um, just makes the most elaborate Japanese food, and it's it's, it's just amazing. Um, but anyway, you don't have to make something elaborate, but we always bring something to share at something like this. Um, well, I guess that's about it. In, in general, and historically, we've had two big events a year. One is normally held shortly after this class ends and is a recognition event where, um, you know, we, we formally welcome you all into the big group and uh, we have recognition for people who have done special things over that year. Um, there's also <coughs> informal events. Uh, recently there was one where a lot of Master Gardeners got together at an outdoor event at a restaurant and that was a lot of fun. Um, anyway, that's what we do. Um, we do need a few more people on the committee, and what the committee members do is just plan these events and make sure that the, um, the entire group is invited. And not only ourselves, but we invite emeritus master gardeners, you know, people who, uh, who have worked with us over the years. Um, you know, it's just another opportunity to remember them. Okay, so I would love to have more people on the committee. Um, you can find our contact information on the internet under social committee. Yes? So are you active now? Are you planning stuff? Or you said you've been inactive and you're starting things up? Or? Um, <laughs> good question. It depends <laughs> upon the pandemic. I mean, for having the, our traditional get togethers, um, you know, we'd love to have one shortly after this class ends, but uh, it probably won't happen this year or early next year. Probably next year, as soon as we can, we'll have a big get together. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
You know, uh, readers have a um, have a saying: "So many books, too little time." <laughs> well, gardeners have the same equivalent: "So many gardens, too little time." <laughs> I have a notebook at home that I have kept of things I've t uh, torn out of the newspaper, out of magazines, anything. Anytime I see a garden that looks like it's a likely. Uh, venue for us to visit on a day trip, <clears throat> I tear it out, excuse me, um, and, um, and we try to have two events a year, two field trips, and these are day trips that go out of here uh, that are not so far that we're gone, you know, till 10 o'clock at night or anything, that we're back by late afternoon. Uh, of course, COVID got in the way of that, but we got creative. <laughs> and we said, hmm, Briggs Avenue Garden. I wonder how many master gardeners have not been there in years because some are very active and some, like me, I don't go to Briggs Avenue. <clears throat> and so it had been quite a while since I had seen it. So last fall, we had a Briggs Avenue tour. It was socially distanced. We were divided into small groups. It worked beautifully. And we have another one of those coming up. And I think Panna gave you a flyer last week, because I came up, I came last week. <coughs> Sorry, I got forgotten. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think she gave you um, a, fly, <coughs> a flyer about that. <coughs> Excuse me, it's the math. <laughs> um, we, <coughs> at the beginning of COVID, had an overnight trip planned to Wilmington. And we were gonna be there two nights, visit three public gardens. I also happened to know someone whose garden was on the Isaiah Garden Tour, and I requested that she allow us to come into her garden. So we were going to be there the weekend after uh, the garden tour when hopefully there was still a lot blooming and a lot uh, to see. But COVID hit and we didn't do, get to do that in 2020. So we said we'll do it in 2021. <laughs> Little did we know that we were still going to be locked down in 2021. So now we're saying we're going to do it in 2022. <laughs> and we'll see. Uh, but we, we had uh, done one other uh, overnight trip a couple of years before in 2018 to Asheville and had gone to uh, uh, Biltmore, of course, and uh, other, uh, the North Carolina Botanical Gardens and uh, uh, I can't remember what that was called, something, Horticultural Garden, I think. So it, that was very successful, not a huge group, but uh, it was a great time to get to know each other. and. And that's part of what we do too, because we are a smaller group. In non-COVID times, Ashley will drive the van, so there could be, you know, 14 people in the van who are socializing. We usually try to go to lunch, and uh, that's a good time to get to know somebody too. But we visit farms, gardens, both public and private, and educational sites. Uh, uh, just depending on on where and how they how they pair up, but it's a great time to get to places that you normally maybe could not see, or normally just don't go. Uh, we have this one coming up to the North Carolina Botanical Garden on October the eighth, and it's interesting to me that somebody said to me this week, "I've never been there." <laughs> <laughs> and it's right here in our backyard in Chapel Hill. So uh, our uh, sculpture in the garden will be uh, during this time. So it's October the 8th. Uh, all the details are on the internet. And somebody just asked me this morning how you sign up. If you go to the internet, do they know how to do that yet? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you go to the internet and go to the calendar and go to October the 8th, you will see the field trip. Um, that's, you know, where is it? Yeah, there. Um, you'll see the event, and that's how you register 
to go. Uh, it cost $10 per person because we, we, uh, we have a guided tour and they charge $5 a head for that. And we also give a little honorarium to, um, to them also. So it's $10. That can be either, either given to Panna or mail to Cap Causey. Uh, sign up here. Lunch will be at ten. An outdoor lunch will be at Tandem in Carborough. And if you want to go to lunch, you have to email me, and my email address is um, is right there. So you can email me that you would like to go to lunch. Um, but if anybody loves to plan trips, and some people like to do this, <laughs> I like to go on trips. <laughs> but, but I'm not one to really want to plan them unless I, I'm the only one to do that. So if you'd love to plan trips, if you'd like to be creative and thinking of places to go, uh, we would love to have you join uh, the field trip committee. One of the things we added in 2019, just before, before COVID, was a winter trip. You know how we all long when it's cold. Oh, we want to see gardens or we want to see something blooming. And we tried that year, we went to an orchid grower and, um, and, and went into the greenhouses, of course that's fine. So we're going to be try to, try to be creative this year and think of some place that we can go in January or February where we won't freeze to death, but we'll be able to experience um, some beautiful um, uh, garden-like uh, garden place. Any questions? Okay. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, it was right after I first started that we went to the Biltmore and I thought I had just like landed in hog heaven because they were like, get in the van, we're going to the Biltmore to see Jamuli Glass and get a special presentation on bonsai trees. I was like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is my kind of job. So with that, I am actually going to, many of you already know um, Sherilyn, our next presenter. Sherilyn is our family and consumer sciences agent and she's really the best of both worlds because she was actually formerly the horticulture agent. So she had my position before she switched to her position, which is why she's so good at all the positions. So um, with that, and she'll be leading you in your tour, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Sherilyn. I'm gonna pass you the uh, Thank the you quicker. so much. <laughs> First off, um, well, thank you so much everybody for coming in. Today, I know I saw a lot of your sweet faces at breaks for the mentor meetup, which was awesome. Um, this afternoon, we'll be having our tour from 2.30 to 4.30. I hope you can join us um, because you got to see Briggs, but you didn't really get like the full nickel tour where you, you know, learn about all the opportunities and things that you can do there. It's a 45-acre property that's owned by the Ag Foundation, and we specialize in just teaching people how to grow food. There's other people who are super interested in pollinators. I do projects out there. We've got beekeepers who keep bees out there. There's just great opportunities. And then sometimes, you know, all of you are gonna find sort of your niche. So you're gonna find your group, and you're gonna find your niche plants that you like to mess around with. So um, one of our master gardeners um, from another class, Beth Austin, came and said, you know, I, I see a billowy border here. And I was like, great, do it. So that's what's so great about that space is that you can go, oh, you got an idea? Awesome, let's, let's do it. We can write a grant. We can, you know, it's like an empty canvas. I love landed facilities. It's my favorite thing. You can, you can do a lot more when you have those kinds of resources. Speaking of those kinds of resources, we get donations. And I would like to share this embarrassment of riches with you. So the cannibal interest donated like about 10,000 of these packets of seeds. So this is for you. Um, you already sorted like so many things upstairs. Uh, Tommy in the back, he's on your nutrition and skater, and I'm teaching him everything I know. Um, so uh, he's learning about vegetable planting today, and he's been sorting these seeds, so he's really learned about different families of vegetables. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of a reiteration today, but there's everything from flowers to all different kinds of vegetables in here. Trey has a uh, a box of these in her house that she sorted for us. <laughs> we're supposed to get like six more of these cases. So please, don't be shy. Take as many as you want. Over half of them are flowers. So we'll, we'll like push this outside during the break. You can just go for it, okay? <laughs> Great. Okay, so vegetable gardening. Uh, as you know, my name is Cheryl Gary, and I really specialize in seed to table food education um, for all ages of people. 
So my degrees are in nutrition and public health. I've been growing food for most of my adulthood. Um, I'm from the desert, so uh, I've spent time in the desert, in the tropics, subtropical regions, and I've been learning about all different kinds of like, not just how food grows in a particular place, but also the uses of the food in that place, um, the ecosystems, the pests, things like that. But since most of my experience was in the deserts of Arizona, I really grew nothing but food there because water is so scarce, you don't waste it on flowers. Now that I'm here and it rains all the time, I've actually been able to get a little bit into flowers, but I mainly enjoy what other people grow because no matter where I end up, I always end up growing food or people donating tons of food to me or, you know, and feeding a ton of people. It's just like my mission in life. It just, it kind of finds you. And so this is it. Um, so not only do I manage Briggs Community Garden to teach people how to grow food, but also the first week or two that you were here, we had the cooking class across the way, and that was like nine hours a day of teenagers cooking. It was Trang and I actually that taught that crazy, crazy class uh, <laughs> for teenagers to learn how to cook for their families. So um, it's really like specializing kind of hands-on food education, seat to table. So, um, but right now, mostly I have an ag life. I don't have that much of a culinary life just because it's been kind of shut down because of COVID. We did some online stuff, but, um, but at least we have Briggs where we can do all kinds of really fun and cool things. But you'll find out about a lot of those fun and cool things when we do our tour this afternoon. Well, why don't we go ahead and dive in and talk a little bit about vegetable gardening. This is very popular. You are in a county serving this county. This is a food county. People are very much into food, um, sustainable farming, uh, gardening, school gardening, church gardening, prison gardening. Um, so not only do I take care of Briggs, but I also teach other gardens how to get started, and not just how to get started, but how to last over the years, because it's really easy to put a garden in. It's difficult to keep one going. And in your backyard, if you put in a garden and it goes fallow, it doesn't really matter. You're the only one that sees it. But if a community comes together, puts in a garden, then it falls apart a year later, it's like an eyesore and it's also a heartbreaker. So my job is to try to figure out Okay, what people are needed, what tools are needed, you know, who's going to be here two, three years from now. All of those things, I, I spend a lot of time on that here in our community. So we'll have to do on a little informal field trip maybe, and we can tour you around to all of the gardens that we've installed, um, like at uh, Durham Housing Authority properties and, and things like that. So um, really fun stuff. I have some pictures in here that are similar to some of the things that we've done. Um, but okay, so let's get started. All right, so we're gonna talk about soil basics. I know you've already had your soil, they've had their soil class already, right? Yeah. Um, some growing systems, uh, nutrition, watering, pest management, um, how to start from seed, which plants are better from seed and not, and then we're gonna go through families of vegetables. Because usually families of vegetables behave in similar ways, they're planted in similar ways, they have similar pests, things like that. This is a perfect time to be teaching this because we are at the transition point of fall gardening fall, over winter to spring, and then summer. For some reason, and you as master gardeners are gonna get this a lot, people always wanna start gardening when they're doing it their first time in the summer. And I would say, you gotta learn arithmetic before you do calculus, and summer gardening is calculus. It's harder. Right now, this gardening starting in September is when the weather cools down, everything's leafy green, there's not that many bugs, you're not very sweaty, it's nice to be outside, someone in the back is cheering, this is my favorite time. And we had our, uh, we had our fall fest this last weekend, and a lady came up to me and was saying like, I, I gotta tell you a secret, I don't like gardening in the summer, I'm like, it's terrible. And she's like, oh my god, you feel the way? I'm like, yes, you come out and you sweat, like, because I run Briggs in the summer, I also run my own garden in the summer, but I put that stuff in there in the spring and I'm like, fend for yourself. I barely weed, I don't do anything, I let it just grow and I go out and harvest. Every couple of days I'll go and grab stuff, whatever, for dinner and it looks like a hot mess about this time. And then I go in, I rip everything out, all of the leaves fall on a huge oak tree in my backyard, I blow all those leaves into my garden and mulch everything and then it looks gorgeous from spring, all the way through spring it looks perfect. And then the summer happens again, and it's just people are like, oh, I want to come see our garden. I'm like, come see me in October. Because <laughs> it's a mess right now. But you know, it just, it just is. It's just if, you, if I spend 10, 15 hours outside of Briggs, I'm not going to go home and like go out there and sweat. Growing vegetables. Isn't that beautiful? This almost looks like um, 
Is this uh, Greg LeHoulier's house? Yeah. I wish Craig LeHoulier was still here, you guys. That's a field trip we need to take. <laughs> he's now in the Western States, but he's the NC Tomato Man. And he wrote a book called Epic Tomatoes. You can look in your library, and he, there's a couple copies there. This is his house. He's a beautiful human. OK, so um, growing vegetables the basics. If you can't grow grass in an area, you cannot grow vegetables there either. <laughs> OK, so you know people often will say, like, oh, the grass doesn't grow here. I'm going to put a, you got a big tree. You can grow mushrooms in the shade, but you can't really grow vegetables. You really need six to eight hours of sunlight a day. If you have less than that, you can grow things in, in the fall, like um, lettuces and things like that. You can do, you, because they don't require a lot of sun. If you want to grow a fruit of any kind, a pepper, anything with a seed inside of it, any of those summer crops, you know, vegetables, plants, all plants are made of light and air and water. That's what they're made of. They're, they're uh, autotrophs. They make their own food. They make starch. So with the power of the sun, they take literally carbon dioxide, we breathe out, and water and create carbohydrates. So if they don't have that battery of the sun to photosynthesize, to make those starches, there's no way you can change that. You, you have to knock down the tree or find a community garden. But to make a leaf, does it, you don't need as much starch as you do for a big, juicy fruit of some kind, like a pepper or an eggplant or an okra, something like that. So that's why you really do need a good amount of sun, especially to grow summer crops. Um, you definitely need well-prepared soil in order for the uh, plants to access nutrients in the soil, the pH needs to be right. You could have all of the nutrients everywhere in the soil, but if the pH is off, the plant does not have the ability to uptake the nutrients. So 6 to 6.5 is ideal. If it's a little higher, that's okay. Um, this is why you don't willy-nilly just line things without getting a soil test. I'm sure, I mean, you're going to say it a million times again and again with people. Did you test your soil? You're going to say that's going to be your first question <laughs> when people call you the problem. Oh, did you test your soil? Well, no. It's like, oh, well, come see me. Here's a box. And you'll tell them how to do it. You're going to have that conversation so much that you'll be able to do it without thinking. Um, so adequate nu nutrients and organic matter. This is really, really important. And we're going to talk about how to prepare a vegetable bed um, so that there's so many ways to do it. Um, but organic matter is super, super important. People think of compost as um, Fertilizer, it's really not. It's more like it creates fertility, but it's not plant food. So it actually boosts organic matter. It, it um, buffers the pH a little bit. It uh, allows soils to hold moisture, but also to drain. Um, it's really, and the microbiological activity is what is able to actually make um, some of the nutrients available to your plants. Um, you're gonna need a consistent water supply and good drainage. So this is another thing that happens quite a bit when people come to me and they want to start a garden, especially like a school garden or a church garden or something. I come and the first question is, where is your water? And people think, oh, well, you know, my water is over there, like where the bathrooms are, and they're going to put their garden here. And I say, no, that, you're not, this is not a good idea. Oh, well, I'll just uh, I'll haul water. One gallon of water is eight pounds. And in the summer, you got to put a lot of gallons of water on that, and it's hot and you're sweaty and you're miserable, you're just gonna lose all your, your summer crops. And those are the ones that are the most important to people. So if your water isn't close, forget about it. Also, people want to use catchment water off of a roof to water vegetables. That's a no-no. Um, if you have catchment water and it's your catchment water and you know how to treat the catchment water, like I know that I have this catchment water and I'm going to water the base of the plant and the water is going to go up through the plant and purify it into the tomato, great, you go ahead. But if it's like a community garden or a school garden or something, you, you can't take that water and water lettuce and then eat the lettuce. Because you can imagine birds fly over and poo on the roof and you know, environmental contaminants from the road end up on the roof and that washes down into that tank and you're putting it on food. So it either has to be purified through a plant or you can um, have a kill step, like you can use that water to water collard greens and then you cook the collard greens. That's okay too. But if it's your water and you know that, you can do that. But you never suggest that to the general public because people don't think about, I think people, with COVID, I was trying to think of the positives, especially with this terrible thing we've been through the past few years. And one of the things that people are more aware of now is cross-contaminating bacteria and things, like things you touch, things you breathe in. We didn't, a lot of people didn't think about that before. Um,
but I teach food safety, so you know it's one of those things that like I think about all the time when I'm working with chicken. You don't turn around and grab the door of the fridge. It's the same kind of thing. You have to think about like I always say when people try to argue with me about the source of the water. I say, well, okay, would you be okay with a five-year-old taking the hose and drinking out of it? And if the answer is no, you don't put it on food. So. Just keep that in mind. But if it's you and you control that water, you can do that. I just don't recommend it to anybody else. Uh, well water or better is a city water supply is kind of the best thing. But like pond water and things like that, you have to be really careful with it. That being said, an orchard, you can water it with whatever water all day long because it goes up through a tree. So the bacteria is not going to end up in the apple or the peach. It's just things like lettuce, things you eat raw that would be a problem. It's all about the soil, people. So it's not dirt, it's soil, as they say. And um, this is a beautiful kind of friable, loamy looking kind of clay mixed with some things. Probably is, yeah, Alabama or Georgia. Um, our clay is a little bit more red, um, but soil is not just a stagnant growing medium. A lot of times conventional agriculture has really looked at it like that for a very long time. And people, of the past 20 years especially, it's kind of spread from the west you know, down to the south, are really paying attention to, it's not this dead thing that just holds plants and you give the plant everything it needs. You feed the soil and the soil feeds the plant. If you look at it as every year you're doing things to care for the soil, it's gonna take care of your plants year after year. So when I think about a vegetable garden, because people are like, oh, I gotta get my garden in and I didn't get done this year, I would say, okay, slow down, it's totally fine. You can garden year round. And you really, if, especially if you're a homeowner, look at the 10 year plan. Like look out five, 10 years from now what you want the garden to be like. It doesn't have to all be perfect this year because every year your soil is gonna get better and better and better if you do some choice few things to take care of it and then it can grow anything and then it can also be like disease and pest resistant and things but there's just some you know choice few things that you need to do every year that don't take a ton of work and it gets better year after year. So as you learned in your soil class, um, uh, a healthy soil is going to have about 5% organic matter, it's going to be about 25% water, 25% air, that's really important in our clay soils, you need air spaces, um, and 45% mineral. We have very mineral soils here because we have clay. So clay to me is like a vitamin pill. There's tons of nutrients in it, it's just that they're not totally balanced nutrients, and they're not, they're, it's an acidic medium that doesn't drain well naturally, so you need to augment the structure of it with water and organic matter and air like fluffing it up to um, make those nutrients available to the plant oh, space and stuff okay note on durham soil okay so sand particles like what is actually on the coast is very sandy soil and that particle is huge um, and then we have silt soils that are either from like ancient seas, ancient lake beds, things like that, that's pretty small. And then clay particle is so small in comparison. So it's, it's in a way good because you can um, build soils and, and it actually holds moisture, which is good. But um, it can also be a problem because if you don't take care of it and you till it, you can turn it into a brick. So it's just a matter of like caring. If you know what your soil is made of, you can care for it over time and, and um, like this, this is going to hold a lot of water. This sand right here, when you have sand, you have very well-drained soils which cut the water more often. So adding organic matter to any three of these is gonna make a better situation for you. So um, sand and clay. Compost, so that's like the most important thing is organic matter. It's not uh, fertilizer, but it adds fertility to the soil. So. Compost is everything, it, and it, it's sort of like whatever problems there are with soil, the solution is always add organic matter to it, pretty much, and you can fix a lot of things. And also not to till, not to till it. So you can till it like the first time, this is, um, there's sort of like old world thinking, as like you go out and you rip wrap the whole thing and break it all up so it's fluffy. But actually, when you're building tilth in soil, especially once you set up your beds, which we'll talk about like double digging and tilling when we get to building beds. Um, you want to rip it up the first time and get that microbiological matter in there. And then the next year, you might turn it over a little bit, add some more organic matter, 
but you are not going to take a tiller and rip it up. A tiller is something that you borrow or rent. You don't own one unless you're going to be doing a lot on your landscape and you have acreage because tilling every year is not a good idea. So if you can imagine like you have all of these little subterranean creatures running around eating organic matter, worms, little centipedes, all kinds of things, uh, fungus, all kinds. And they're making these little holes in air spaces. And so, you know, this year I might grow a carrot and you see that taproot of the carrot, but there's all of these little, um, uh, little pieces that come off little, little kind of hair roots, fine, fine hair roots. Some of the longer carrots have hair roots down to like eight feet, some of them. But when I pull out that carrot, I shear off all of those little side roots and those break down and all of these microbiological, you know, th there's all kinds of things, subterranean creatures breaking those things down. So then now I've got all of this tilth in the soil. I've got air spaces, I've got water. When it rains, water can run down into the deep earth that way. And if in the summer, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna plant a tomato. If I plant a tomato somewhere around there, that tomato has places where it can just run roots down to take the spaces that the carrot used to take. But if I take a tiller and I rip it up, now I've got like this kind of hard pan, not hard pan, but just, I've now silted it all. And so it's almost, it's almost like, a, like we're creating an underground micro city and I've just destroyed all of it. So that's why it's okay to like take a mulch fork and turn a little compost in is fine, but you don't want to go bananas and just compress things, especially with our, um, our clay soils. You just ruin the tilth. And there's a lot of research around this too. I'm not just making this up. They've done extensive research on um, no-till agriculture. It's a lot less work for you, and it's better for the soil in the long run. So, because we're taking the long view, the 10-year view. Okay, you can actually, besides getting stuff that's already broken down, you can get, uh, you can do some cover crops. So cover crops, there's lots of different kinds of cover crops for different reasons, but some of the most, uh, what they call green manure, are things that are legumes. And we're gonna talk about the legume family coming up. But one of them, like hairy vetch, clover, those are legumes. And legumes have a special relationship with bacteria in their roots called rhizobia. So there's this little bacteria in the roots and it has the ability to capture atmospheric nitrogen, I believe. Is that nitrogen like 15%? I can't remember what they have. I think it's like 15% of what we breathe in. Um, Rhizobia can capture that atmospheric nitrogen, and the rhizobia is like, hey plant, you want some of this nitrogen? I need some sugar, and they trade. So, and um, legumes are the only things to do. So bees, peas, uh, peas, peanuts, um, mesquite trees. Um, oh, there's so many different kinds of trees that are leguminous, but basically they make their own nitrogen, and they're by capturing it from the air. So. You don't just grow them and it stays in the soil. You grow it and then you kill this off. You cut the tops off of it, let it die, and then work it into the soil. And it breaks down and all that nitrogen that's captured and is now part of the body of the plant in the form of proteins breaks down in the soil and it adds fluffiness and tilt and things that are dying on the top. There's a lot of top feeders, especially our favorite worms come and they feed on stuff that's breaking down on the top. So they come up and they feed and then they go back down and they create all of these pathways in the soil underneath and it's like super beneficial. So um, protect the soil when, when it's not in use with cover crops. So, you know, when you say you want to let, let, let something lay fallow, you could grow this, cut it off and let it die on the surface and just leave it like that. Um, it keeps, um, weeds from sprouting, it prevents soil erosion, it protects and keeps the soil moist. A lot of times people will take like a bed and they let it dry out completely. Like if you're letting something lay fallow and it doesn't rain for a month or two, it's a good idea, especially if you're gonna plant it soon to keep the soil wet because in order for microbiological activity to be going on in the soil, it needs water. So don't let it dry out completely if you can help it. And one of the ways you can help it is by doing cover crops. So it just kind of protects the soil. So yeah, cowpea, soybeans, millet, summer. There's also like, you can do oats. Uh, there's the crimson clover. Um, you, there's a lot of different um, crops that you can do. There's um, a lot of documentation. Like Cornell is a really excellent, Cornell and Clemson University's Cornell is in New York. Clemson is in South Carolina. They have awesome like gardening pages. We have good gardening pages too, but I really like their resources as well. Um, and you can, we also have a couple of books, I think, in the library about cover crops, so check those out. Um, cover crops is just a wonderful way to, um, if you're gonna let something lay fallow, 
um, you're actually doing something active to benefit the soil, even if you're not producing something to eat. Yes? Um, I just want to clarify what I think that the, the cover crops are there to basically cover the soil when you're not growing anything, and then you're letting it die down afterwards so that the vegetation nutrients go back into the soil. So is that sort of true for when we're cleaning up beds? You know, don't don't take everything out to clean to make it look clean and, and put in our recycling or in the um, mulching area. Compost, like your compost heap? Just let it compost directly into the bed. It depends on what the plant is. Like if you decided that you wanted to do a cover crop but you still wanted food out of there, I'd plant a bunch of peas or beans because then once you get your peas or beans off of them, you can cut them down and let them die on the surface if you want, if you want to leave it lay fallow, if you want to give it a break. Or if you just want to plant it now, you can, let's say that was the spring and you did your peas, you could cut it all down and then just dig a little hole, open up a little hole and put your tomato in it and you've got this thick layer of mulch that's feeding the soil, choking out weeds and um, allows your tomato to grow out of it and you don't have to work so hard in the summer to pull weeds up. But if you wanted to make it look beautiful, to put flowers in it, and you're going to make it like a feature that people look at, yeah, rip all that stuff out, put it in your compost pile, and let it break down. However, there's certain things you don't put in your compost pile, like tomatoes. Or, I mean, you can compost tomatoes. It's just, you have to be really careful. Anything that's diseased, if you've got like something with a fungal blight on it, or, you know, um, something just wrapped with aphids, put it in the garbage, get it out of there. You can even put it in your yard waste. Like they have such large composting facilities that heat things up. You have the ability to break things down. You don't want that in your passive backyard composting. Because if you throw the bugs in there, they're just gonna fly back over. It's not like they're like, oh, we're in a different location. You know, they'll find their way back, back to uh, what, you, what you're doing there. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's also things like, you know, squash bugs or pickle worms. They can overwinter there and then attack your plants the next year. So just be mindful of what you're putting in there. Um, yes? So when you hear people talk about turning in the cover crop, yeah. does that mean what you're saying is you say the clover, you mow it down, and you let it dry, and then when you say turn in, is that really just using yeah. the fork to turn in, yep. not to till it? Not to till it. Not to till it, no. You can cut it up with a um, shovel and just turn the soil over and like then rake it. Top four, yep. six inches? Top six, eight inches if you want, whatever is easiest for you. Yeah, or you can plant right in it. So you just don't let this stuff go to seed. So there's a lot of different kinds of clovers. There's like a Dutch clover, which is a perennial, and that's with the little pretty white flowers that feed the bees. There's a mini clover and a micro clover that only get this big. We're trying real hard to get that to take in our uh, soon to be orchard at Briggs. And then there's this crimson clover that's an annual. It goes to flower like this, cut it down. <laughs> Don't let it get pollinated. You can let the bees feed on it a little bit, but I wouldn't go too crazy with that. As soon as it starts to flower, cut it down because if you have a bunch of seeds, clover seeds are really small and they get everywhere and this will just come up like a weed. So you prevent pollination or too intense of pollination and maturation of seeds. And then you just get this kind of, unless you want to save some seeds for the next year, but they will just keep coming up. Um, just depends on how um, perfectionistic you are with like what comes up and what doesn't. So, okay. Ways to grow. If you're lucky enough to have land, if you don't live in Durham, <laughs> you can do rows. Uh, raised rows are kind of nice. Um, you want to look at the way that the land slopes so that as water comes across it, you are able to capture some of the water that it's actually able to drain because if if your slope is like, let's say the slope of the land is like this, this would be the wrong way to put your, your rows because basically all the soil would wash away and it wouldn't be able to trap any of that water. So you could do it kind of on an angle and then the water would wash across and you get um, better, um, better watering. You kind of like use the landscape to, um, to work it so that you don't have to water as often. Because um, water that falls from the sky and you can capture it and have it more efficient is just a way more efficient way to do it than trying to like capture it in a, you know, in a container or, you know, that sort of thing. So um, just be mindful of that if you're doing rows. Raised beds, because of our clay soils, are the most popular thing. When you do raised beds, you don't want to use treated lumber. A lot of times people will, they won't know, and they'll look at that. If you see it, it's been dipped in that green stuff, that's not to use for your raised beds. Um, 
um, we have some beds that are falling apart, but we use untreated lumber, and it, it, uh, the bed like this would probably last you at least 10 years. So um, you could get some eco-friendly stuff to put on it that actually um, is food safe, and it um, prevents the wood from breaking down as fast. So um, it's called eco something, I can't remember the name of it, but um, it's, it's food safe. So often another thing that people will try to do with a raised bed is look at this raised bed and they put landscape fabric underneath it. Don't do that. I mean, you're basically, you've created now an aquarium for a fish to live in rather than having it be able to get into the lake or ocean. So don't put landscape fabric or plastic under this. The weeds are not gonna come up through here. The weeds are gonna land on top of it and grow. So don't worry, or they're already in the soil that you got. Um, you do want at least eight inches of growing space. The way that I recommend doing these, and a lot of people won't do it, and it's fine, you don't have to do it this way, but if you have more time and strength than money, double digging a bed is the absolute best thing that you can do. So I should have brought in a thing to show you it, but basically, give it a goo, double digging a bed. So you want the soil to be not too wet and not too dry. Uh, ask Train about this, because she's done it. <laughs> I'm very proud of her. Okay, so you dig down six to 12 inches, and you pull the soil out. And then you mix it back in with half compost. And that gives you, if you only have eight inches here, now you have another eight inches under the soil. It drains better. You're using native soil rather than bringing in topsoil from somewhere else. Um, it will give you a much, it's sort of like fast forwards your soil development by years. Because if I just go and get whatever from one of the retailers around here and I get half topsoil, half compost, that would be good, but if I only have this eight inches right here, if I didn't have a double stack like this, um, my vegetables will be good, especially my um, shallow rooted stuff like lettuce and things, um, but if it has 16 inches to grow into, you're already gonna have a better plant. So the deeper the soil is, the better off you are, and that's how to artificially create kind of deeper soil that has better tilth. Um, that being said, if I only have this eight inches and my tomatoes don't look great, they'll probably get better year after year because I'm putting all this organic matter on top of it and all of the worms and things are moving towards it to eat. So eventually over the years, my soil's gonna get better and better and better, but you can fast forward that if you double dig the bed. But it is a lot of work, but you only have to do it one time. So, um, or you can double stack it, fill it with soil. It just depends on how much money, time, patience that you have. If you got a teenage kid living at home, Great thing to get him to do, you know. If it's a good workout, you don't have to go to the gym, you can just double dig the bed. Um, but yeah, raised, raised beds are really wonderful, and that's primarily what people do around here because the drainage is good. Um, you can control weeds a little bit better. You don't have to get down on your knees all the time. You can actually sit on the edge of the bed. At home, I actually have this made out of cinder blocks because um, our land like slopes ever so slightly. And I knew that when we bought this house, I was gonna grow old there because it's a small house, all one floor. It's like, I'll be 80. Everything I do to this house, I have to look at it like when I'm 80, I want my little fruit trees and my little garden that I can sit on the side of and just, you know, putts around. So I actually have cinder blocks and our land is, is sl sloped ever so slightly. So we dug in the, the, uh, the cinder blocks so they're level. So even though I walk slightly downhill by six inches across the entire bed, the bed is level. So that can be a little hard to do with these. You can dig them in though. So if you have a slope rather than doing a sloped bed, you just dig around and you can set the bed. And that's really easy to do if you're digging, double digging the bed. So um, and my, um, I think I have yeah, a double stack of uh, cinder blocks and then a little red cap. So it's like a little seat you can sit on. And then containers, I mean, of course, containers for days. Containers you can get like, we have a lot of containers at Briggs, Master Gardeners are allowed to use. Um, so if you want to do a container vegetable garden, you just have to be really mindful of the water. Um, there's not a lot, you have to water them once or twice a day sometimes if it's really, really hot and your plant gets really, really big and it's creating gorgeous, huge slicer tomatoes, you need to water it all the time or the plant is going to stress out and, uh, and possibly die. So just be mindful of that. Containers are awesome but it's a good idea to put them right next to your water. Like if, at my house, I have like, I, you walk up this walk to get to the front door. If I have stuff in containers, because it's so hot, they go right out there. That's where all the trees are for our orchard that we're putting in. So I don't forget them for a second. I can tell in an instant if they're stressed and they need more water. I don't want those to go too far into stress because they're 
they're not even my plants, they're for all of us, so I'm like, ah! So I water them sometimes twice a day. Okay, rose. Um, so we talked about this a little bit, very traditional. Raised rose help with drainage. It's really easy to mulch in here. Whatever you do your rose, remember, you do have to get a wagon or a wheelbarrow in between these, so just be mindful of the size of them. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. No, no, please do. Oh, material for containers, there's so many different kinds. I mean, you could do galvanized tubs. Those are really cute and farmy, like shabby chic. Uh, just plastic, you can get the blown plastic containers. It just depends on how pretty you want them to be. Grow bags are really um, popular. You can do plastic grow bags, or they have these kind of like cloth ones with handles. I grew a mess of potatoes last year in those because somebody gave me some of them. Um, really whatever works for you. There's, you know, just make sure that the drainage is good and that you water frequently. The bigger the container, the less you're gonna have to water it. So, yeah, something to keep in mind. Yeah, so we talked about single or double lines of crops. That one's a double stack, which is kind of cool. And it is really easy to put irrigation in there, which is nice. So, um, and you need one inch deep between rows. Uh, that looks beautiful. Okay, so raised beds, we talked about this a little bit. This is kind of similar to what I have at home, only I have a double stack with a capper because then you can sit on the edge and reach, reach across, which is good. Um, you don't want them any wider than four feet because you need to be able to reach them from either side. If you have a fence and you put a bed there, make sure it's only like two, three feet wide because you need to be able to reach in there and see what you're doing. Um, people often, I'll see, they'll go to their house to check out their gardens and they'll have um, like, you know, a garden this big across, you end up having to put a path down the middle of it and you lose growing space anyway. So it's much better. You also, once you prepare your bed and they're all fluffy and wonderful, you don't step on them. You wanna like keep your weight off of it if you can, unless you have to. Send a little kid up in there to do it, something, somebody lighter. Um, but you don't wanna stomp around in it and press everything down. So that's why you want it just easy to reach across. Um, yeah, so can be made high enough to provide easy access. And in the next one, which is actually in the containers, I'll show you kind of what we've been doing at the um, Durham Housing Authority properties so that um, it's much easier for people to sit next to. Okay, yeah, we talked about that, at least eight inches deep. Um, yeah, so if you're making it over a hard surface, one of the gardens that I take care of, the Prosdale um, Retirement Community, Man, that is a very, very, we should all be so lucky to age in a place like that. Like, it is so nice. Anyway, they made them a community garden. They wanted one, they planned for it. They poured a concrete slab for them to put the garden on top of. I was like, can we get a hammer? But it was already too late, they were building the beds. And so they did like three feet deep beds because there's no communication with the earth anymore. You're basically, you have to enrich like I said, like go out in the forest and dig up some worms and things and put them in the bed because there's literally zero way for them to get in here now. And you want to create a really rich environment. So just be aware of that. And also be aware if you're, some people want to do this like on a top of a parking lot or something, there is a program at Duke Sustainability Office to let you know what used to be on that parking lot. Was it a dry cleaner? You're not going to want something like that. If there was a dry cleaner there, there could be some like serious toxins that you don't want to end up in the soil. So um, if it comes to that, just come see me. We can find resources for it, no worries. Um, so fill with a mix of soil and compost, 50 to 75% soil. So remember how I was saying that you can use your 50% soil, you can actually use the soil beneath it rather than buying soil. You can just dig up that soil that's underneath it and mix compost back into it and fluff it up and it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, or you can just buy it. If you have more money than time and energy, buy it, throw it in there. It's good too. It just takes a little while for those little buggers to get up in there. Okay, container. So I don't consider this a container, really. This is, to me, a raised bed. This is what I've been doing with them um, because there's so much soil in there. Um, I think of a container like a container, like, you know, some of the stuff we have out front, really beautiful. Um, this to me is kind of a raised bud, but say that somebody wanted to do something in a parking lot or a hard surface, this would be a great uh, solution for that. So, um, so it really would be a container at that point because they can't communicate with the earth underneath it. But with these, what I'll do is I'll cut a huge hole in the bottom, two huge holes in the bottom of these types of tubs. Um, and what you can do is if somebody has a walker or a wheelchair, or you can take a bench and stick this right here, they're usually six feet wide, 
two feet tall and two feet wide, you can sit down right next to it and reach completely across it. So this works really well for like retirement communities, elder communities, um, lots of places. Um, plus they look really cute too. I mean, I love this whole galvanized look. I think it's, um, you know, funky farm fresh. And you're cutting the whole for drainage? Yep. So it doesn't have drainage. Can you just, or do you worry about a lot of the soil flow? Can you put something over that? Well, no, 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 no. I don't put anything over it because the reason we cut a big hole in it, it's on, when it's in contact with soil, what we do is cut big holes in it so that there is a big opening to the soil. So I'll put soil in oh, here. Things, but if it's on a hardscape. If it's on a hardscape, I would probably just poke holes in it. And yeah. elevate, would you elevate it so you can at least get some air circulation from it? If it's no, on no, as long as it drains well. I haven't had to put one on, you know, solid like that. But, um, you know, if you had to move it, it would definitely make it easier. You can move it with a forklift. Um, but that's probably what I would do is cut holes in it, like good size holes in it, a bunch of them. So that way you don't get a lot of soil erosion, you get good drainage, but then you have to pick it up and move it around, you're good to go. So, especially if it's out of business, sometimes they want to move things, usually at a home or they're, they're not really necessarily doing that. So, um, but yeah, it depends. Like if it's, if it's on a hard surface and it has holes in it, it is a container. If it's in contact with the ground, it's kind of a raised bed. Um, so yeah, if you're gonna do a raise, if you're gonna do a container, it's best to use potting soil, not garden soil. A lot of times when you buy garden soil, it's actually stuff to like add tilt to the ground that you're working with. It isn't necessarily compost to put perlite and things in it to allow it to drain, um, but you are you do want to use potting soil because it drains really well, but it also holds moisture. So. Um, and with the raised bed, I would do kind of like as if I was digging up the ground. I would do like half soil, half compost. But if it's going to be the one with the holes drilled in it, I would treat it just like that. Would treat it like a container, absolutely. Um, so uh, slow release fertilizers work. No need to soil test. So the reason we don't is it's already been tested. You're purchasing it in bags, so they already know what the pH is. They know that you're going to be it's going to be near neutral because you're going to be growing plants in it in containers. Uh, but you do need to water daily. So this one probably won't need to be watered daily because it's a larger mass of soil. The larger the container, the more water you can, that the plant can hold on to and the soil can hold on to. But if it's a wee one like this and you got a big tomato growing out of it, that thing's gonna need water a couple times a day, so. Okay, this is interesting. Craig Lahoulier has a whole book about straw bales. Um, this is interesting. I've seen people do it. It does require a lot of fertilizer. You're basically breaking this down and the plant is eating the nutrients that you're putting in the hay bales. You do have to be a little bit careful with where you get your, your straw. Um, there's a pesticide, what's it, chlorpyrifos? Is that the name of it? That same one. Yeah, I, I've only seen it written. I've yeah, never yeah, yeah. heard it. But, um, it causes really bad curling in tomatoes. Um, tomatoes are very, very sensitive to it. And hay fields often have it sprayed on there. So you just have to be really careful with that and, and know where you're getting your straw. Um, if I was gonna grow like this, I would probably grow it in a galvanized tub so that as that breaks down, I can use the soil that I've created. Um, but that's just because I'm a conservationist. But if you want to know about this, there's a lot of um, information on it. Craig Lahoulier does a really good job. He grows most of his stuff like this. But if you have like contaminated soils and stuff, this is a great way to grow like summer crops. And, um, well, any crops pretty much. And um, uh, this holds on to water really, really well. But you do have to water it pretty, um, pretty evenly. But it has to break down a little bit first so there's like a medium that the plant can grow in. There we go. Okay. How are we doing on time? I know we like another 30 minutes and then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Nutrition and fertilization. Okay. Did, you, did they learn about fertilizers yet? Yeah, but we can always use Do it again. Let's talk about it again. Um, and I have a little bit of a take on fertilizers. Um, so um, we know that 32-10-10, as high as this is, we know this is a chemical fertilizer. Um, Anything this high can burn your plants. Be really careful with it. Read the label. That's another thing as master gardeners, you're going to say 8,000 times to people. Read the label, whether it's a pesticide, an herbicide, insecticide, any of those pests, or fertilizer. Read how much you're supposed to put on there, especially with a chemical fertilizer. It is very, very powerful and strong, and you can burn your plants with it, especially the nitrogen. So just be aware of that. Um, so it's percentage by weight. So if that's 10 pounds, 3.2 
pounds of it is pure nitrogen. And then one pound of each would be phosphorus and potassium. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I have a preference for OMRI fertilizers, the Organic Materials Review Institute. Um, the reason being is, um, you know, we all want to save the earth. And a lot of people don't know that in order to get nitrogen, like in it for a chemical fertilizer that's pure nitrogen, you have to use so many fossil fuels. And the like gases that come off of that, the greenhouse gases, are way like hundreds of times more damaging than carbon dioxide. It's just they take natural gas and they pull atmospheric nitrogen out of the air and basically make solid out of it. So if somebody donates that to my garden, I'll use it. It already exists, you know, I'm not, but I'll never buy it. That's just me um, because any of the Omri fertilizers, most of them, not all of them, but the organic fertilizers, are somebody turned trash into cash. They use a byproduct from the meat industry or the leather industry or something to create that um, in, in the nitrogen. And we'll talk about that when we get to there. Phosphorus, we're getting towards peak phosphorus. Like 2033, we may have mined most of the phosphorus out of mines in the world. But if you get the army fertilizer, it's bones. They use bones, it's turning trash into cash. It's like we're reclaiming something, because we all need phosphorus, all life forms need phosphorus to live. And so there's phosphorus in everything, but to get pure phosphorus, you mine it. So, you know, if we, if we choose things that are turning trash into cash, we're keeping things out of the landfill, and we're not pushing ourselves further to the point of not being able to access, you know, this pure thing. And the same thing with potassium. Potassium is also mined. So do you look for that, is that an organization, OMRI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, do you look for that kind of designation on the label? They're like, always there. I know we don't, we, we aren't allowed to say certain things. Because there's lots of brands that have Like this. Espoma, for example, would that be? Espoma is on the yeah, it's on the Omri list. So they might have like a list online that you can see. 100%, yeah, you just look up Omri list. But anything that is on the Omri list, oh, they're going to tell you on their label because that you can use on organic farms. Okay. It always is going to cost a little bit more because it's a tree hugging product. Um, and um, also, you know, because natural gas and fuels are subsidized by the government. Um, and so, I mean, so is meat, but anyway, um, suffice it to say, it's also very hard to burn your plants with a lot of these because it'll be like 624. So, because it's, there's a whole lot of other stuff in there. They do cost a little bit more money, but to me it's worth it. But again, it doesn't mean you're a bad person if you use chemical fertilizer, go ahead. You know, people donate it to us. It's like, yeah, I'll use it on the outside of the fence and I'll use it on the inside of the fence on food, but if, you know, we have to fertilize something, it was free and it already exists in the world. So I'm not gonna say like, no. Yes? So the first one that was recommended when I did my soil test, which I may have to redo, was 2100, which suggests to me that it's mainly the nitrogen. Um, and then when I looked up the, the content of that, it says, well, you know, we can't test properly for nitrogen because it's unstable, so we're just going to suggest you use this as a general fertilizer. But I'm, what I'm sort of hearing is, well, if it's not really adding nitrogen and it's a general, maybe, maybe I don't even need anything? Um, maybe not. Nitrogen gets used up really fast, and it just depends on, like, what you're going to put there. You're going to plant corn, you're going to need it. Okay. Uh, you're going to put in uh, lettuce, eh, maybe a little. Yes. Sorry, and like this is like a really interesting one, nitrogen specifically. So if you have ornamental beds, I wouldn't worry about it as much, right? Like you probably have enough. What the lab is doing, they can't test for nitrogen, but they're used to working with farmers. It really matters if they get five pounds or 5.2 pounds off that plant. And so they're just gonna like shoot it as high as they can with totally optimizing all the nutrients because it matters to a farmer's bottom line. For a home gardener, they're still giving the farmer numbers, but if like you're growing an azalea or you're growing, you know, a shrub, it doesn't it doesn't really matter for the most part. So until I start seeing nutrient deficiencies, don't do anything. Not for nitrogen especially, I would be like, you know, you might sprinkle a little bit of something on there right before it starts growing, something like an omri listed that's got a low percent. But I wouldn't get super concerned about those nitrogen numbers, especially on ornamental plant things. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's see. 
take care of chemical fertilizers so you don't burn your plants. Also, if you put, like, some people go crazy with nitrogen, it ends up in waterways and causes like, causes, like, algal blooms and things. So just be mindful of it when you use it. Follow the directions on that page. Okay, plants need nitrogen because that's how you get that gorgeous green leafy growth. It's essential for photosynthesis. It creates proteins in plants. So nit the nitrogen groups, like we think of carbohydrates when we eat, protein is how we get our nitrogen groups. And so that's why when nitrogen, which proteins break down things like uh, blood and feather meal, leather dust, cotton seed, soybean meal, these are all high protein items. And when they break down, they release the nitrogen back into the earth. So, you know, all life needs protein and carbohydrates, but carbohydrates is your carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen groups, and your proteins are your nitrogen groups. So it's this kind of like protein cycle that, that we're living on. Uh, but that's how the plant is able to grow beautiful, gorgeous leaves to be able to photosynthesize. Um, if there's not enough, you'll get yellowing on it and it works up the plant. Um, they can also be really stunted because they're not, they're not only are they not able to photosynthesize effectively, they're not able to produce proteins to be able to, because proteins are not just like what we eat or what makes up our muscle. It's also all the enzymes. All the enzymes in our body are nothing but protein. They're bioactive proteins. And if we don't have them, they don't have, they can't make bioactive proteins to do things like photosynthesize, grow, sway back and forth in the, in the air, uh, absorb water, everything, you know, kind of like what we do. We blink our eyes, we see, all of these things require enzymes and protein. And so that's what nitrogen is. Um, so chemical sources, we talked about the atmospheric nitrogen. Um, and then the natural sources, these are all, like when they kill animals for food, this is what, so people, I don't know if there's any vegan out there, but just to let you know, plants are absolute carnivores. They are eat anything. So they're not vegetarian or vegan. Um, they absorb, they're basically like taking what's broken down into its elemental form and taking it up to create food for everything else on earth. So um, they definitely eat meat. Um, but blood and feather meal, leather dust, cotton seed and soybean meal, these are all um, nitrogen sources. Okay, phosphorus. So root, flower, and seed and fruit development. Oh, real quick. If you load this up with a bunch of nitrogen and it's a fruiting plant, you won't get any fruit. <laughs> so like, if you do that by accident, let's say you, you put too much compost into something. I've done that before, I think, is what I did. And, you know, it took a long time. I finally got some fruits, but I had just an overabundance of green. What was it, a tomato? Yeah, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. Um, can you fix that if you? If yeah, you give it phosphorus that, and potassium. Just um, add, you would add the other two. You could, yeah. I mean, the nitrogen gets used up. It might not be that. It depends on, especially in the case of the solana the sol solanaceae family, the peppers and tomatoes and all that. When it gets real hot, and you, if you put your tomatoes in a little bit late, and it's really, really hot, they won't produce fruit for a little while because after up like 90, 95 degrees, especially when it's humid, the pollen can become sterile and they're self-fruitful plants. Um, one thing you can help that with, just to give it a try, six o'clock in the morning when you're having your coffee or whatever, whatever time you wake up in the morning before it gets really hot, go and shake your plant a little bit and try to get it to self-pollinate. Um, it just depends, because I know, like when I lived in Arizona and it was 110 degrees every single day for months, like if, if you, you would put your tomatoes in in like February, and you get a beautiful crop till like May when it starts to launch into 100 degrees. And then you just have gorgeous green foliage and you keep it alive or whack it back. So it's just a little plant. And it would grow and grow and grow. And then come September, October, it would start putting fruit on again. And we would do a big harvest right before Thanksgiving. Because I, I would always have a ton of tomato plants and I'd send the children out into the garden and be like, kids, I have tons of nieces and nephews. Get out there, harvest every plant you see. And they would like pick and bring in these like buckets and buckets of tomatoes right at Thanksgiving. So that's, a, that's also an issue that could also be, but yeah, if you load things up, and it's not really gonna be from compost unless you have chickens or something and it's like just super nitrogenous. Like ours, mine definitely has that because I have 14 chickens in my backyard. But um, it's, it's really not normal. Usually compost is not so gonna be. that wouldn't have been the culprit in that situation to have like except that green and no fruit. Then, I mean, yeah, fruit. it could be, if it's beautiful green, it could be that you have a lot of nitrogen and it's too hot. And then it, it'll go, this, the nutrient will go through the quickest, it'll 
clear. Okay. Yeah, when it rains and yeah, you can, okay. you'll use it up. Or you could supplement it with some bone meal or something like that. That can help out. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so too much can cause plants to shed flowers and not set fruit. So if, if your flowers are dropping off, that can definitely happen. Um, okay, next phosphorus. Um, so I know because of our, we have a wood burning stove and I have a very motivated husband who likes to maintain the land and not waste anything. And I didn't know that he was taking every, we heat our house with a freestanding wood stove, like, because we have a source of free oak wood that's really old. And he was taking the wood ash and dumping it on compost pile for like two years and I did not know it. So I tested my soil in my garden and it's at like 7.5 and then I mean the phosphorus and potassium is off the charts. It's so high. I was like, you are not to do this anymore. You are to spread it out across our third of an acre. Do not put any more in the compost because it's out of control. It's so high. So I'll never have to supplement like for years and years it's going to take for me to go through all of that. Um, so yeah, don't just willy-nilly throw things on the soil, especially when you can buy N, P, or K separate from each other in natural forms. Um, so this is not water soluble, so you can, well, you don't, not really till, you can just turn it in. You could take a little bit of it and like, if you have a balanced fertilizer, you can just, like if you're putting in a tomato or something, you can just mix it in a little in the soil as you're planting the tomato and you're good to go. Um, so bone meal, ash, and algae are great sources of phosphorus. Potassium, so overall health and growth of potassium. So um, people need potassium in life, you know, to eat. And a good source of potassium is uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, and so the plant uptakes this and we actually end up eating it. So it's a, you know, it's a great thing. People think like, oh, you need potassium, eat a banana. It's true, there's a good amount of potassium, but potassium is in all kinds of fruits and vegetables. It does the same job in fruits and vegetables as it does in our body, and, and I mean, besides all of this overall health, um, it's actually like a, it's a water exchange chemical. So it's a, it's a positively charged um, atom that allows us to exchange water between membranes plus a million other things. Um, so overall health and growth, um, that's why it's able to do like, when it comes to water regulation, um, it increases disease resistance, cold hardiness, and drought tolerance. So um, the kind of water movement within a plant, this is one of the main things that controls that. So, um, but fortunately we have a lot in our soils here, especially if you use, um, uh, if you use um, compost, which is great. Um, the, it's also called potash. We do uh, mine this. So if you want a pure potassium, you can mine it. Um, but green sand, which is also mined, by the way, there's these sort of like um, algal deposits in ancient lakes and seas, and it would, would deposit this like chunk of green, basically, and they mine it and grind it up, and you can use it, but it's basically algae. Um, wood ash, and you can do kelp meal. Kelp, kelp meal is totally renewable. There's seaweed everywhere, um, so that's how you'll find it in natural fertilizers. But you can buy this on its own as well as an individual thing if you needed it. Okay, so we were talking about pH. Six to six point five is ideal for growing vegetables. Mine, unfortunately, is way up here, um, but I added some sulfur to it, so it's going to kind of come this way over time. But you can see like how all of these things are much more available at this pH. So this is kind of ideal. If you wanted to grow things like blueberries, that's going to be like right here. <laughs> okay, soil sampling. You're going to say it a thousand times. Um, you guys have all seen this. Like you can tell this needs to come, we'll see what are we growing here? Flower garden and lawn. So this is gonna be different, this is kind of a bad example. It should be 6.5, it should be like over here for vegetables. Um, it would be higher, this range would be over here, but you can see that um, uh, that they need to add some. My, my has, mine is like totally black. It's completely, <laughs> yours is too. <laughs> I was like, whoa, when I saw it. Like, I'm really glad we tested that. So yeah, so we were talking about like these different groups. Um, you can see this person really, yeah, they really need potassium, but you can just buy this individually. You don't necessarily, because it's hard to find 15, 0, 14. That is not available to a homeowner. So you can just buy these individually. Okay, let's see, we've got 10 more minutes. 
Um, so yeah, there's some like osmocote that are like slow release fertilizers, um, and there are some organic options. The 10 10 10 um, dissolves in water. Liquid fertilizers are good, but they are like a boost. So especially if you're doing little starts, you know, little guys, these are great. I really love um, like manure tea, especially fish emulsion. It smells terrible. But basically, it's another way to turn trash into cash. It's like waste from fishing industry. It's pure nitrogen. It's like six zero zero. And so for leaf growth, when you've got like right before we had our plant sale, the two weeks prior, we hit everything with fish emulsion, and the plants are like whoosh. They just like you know go super fast, and they're like little buff soldiers in there. Um, so fish emulsion is great. Foliar feedings or something, if you haven't looked that up, that's a really efficient way to feed plants where you are basically feeding them intravenously. You make a very dilute solution and you spray it on the plants early in the morning when the stomata are open. And it's basically like, you know, if you, you know, take a pill of something, you usually need a lot of that, whatever you're taking, to make it work because it has to go through your digestion. That's how it is when you put um, fertilizer on the ground. But if you inject a drug, you only use a tiny, tiny amount because you're basically circumventing any of the digestion breakdown of that particular molecule. So it's the same thing with this. You, if you're gonna do a foliar feeding, read the label. Don't just willy-nilly like put it, because you can actually really burn and hurt your plants if you do a foliar feeding um, and you make it too powerful. So yes, this is what compost usually is if you don't have chickens or poo in it of some kind, it is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So it's mainly for adding tilt. Watering, you need one inch of water per week. Um, so for most vegetables, you wanna keep the top inch moist most of the time, except for in the case of like peppers. If you like hot peppers, let these dry out in between. If you really like spice, stress your plants a little bit. And, ooh, and if you like spiced peppers, we're gonna to come to Briggs, you know, pick all you want. Um, there's a bunch there now. Um, but if the plant gets a little bit stressed, ooh, spicy. Like the, that capsicum is a, that cap capsaicin is a, a sort of a byproduct of the plant being stressed. So that's why you can get a jalapeno and it tastes like a green pepper, or you'll get a jalapeno and it will burn you, burn you, burn you. It just depends on the environment, sort of the epigenetics, the environment that the plant lived in and what it experienced through its lifetime. So wet foliage, that's the thing, like if you, I do this a lot with volunteers, I'll say go water that tomato bed, and you see them just like shh, spraying the whole plant, don't do that because uh, tomatoes especially, we'll talk about this in a little bit, are um, narcissistic and rude, and they like things just the way they like them, and they're fussy girls, and they don't like to get wet, it messes up their hair. So ideally, the way the tomatoes would love it is if their foliage was dry their whole lives and you just watered at the roots. That's how they love it. So don't be spraying leaves of plants if you can help it. In the winter, it doesn't matter as much because there's not all the fungus growing around, but fung fungal and bacterial blights are real bad if you wet down um, foliage. Uh, pest management. So I'm gonna show you, um, do we have a box of those? Um, Ashley, do we have a box of those like crop, just like southeastern mm -hmm. crop? We'll pull some of those out. It's basically this book that farmers get and they have to change it every year. Um, because it basically has like the crop, the pests of that crop, and the recommendations for spraying those bugs. Ignore that part. That part doesn't really matter. The reason it has to come out every year is because they're constantly re-recommending different kinds of pesticides so that there's a particular pest that does not come resistant. Um, you guys probably aren't going to be using it. A lot of that stuff's restricted use pesticides. It's not really going to mean anything to you. But that book is valuable because if you're like, got this cucumber and I don't know what this pest is. They can only be like one of five things. So you just like, oh, okay, look, I see a squash bug. Like it's, it's a nice book that you can have that's free that like if you're gonna keep vegetables, you'll know what every pest is because the pests don't really change that much. The chemicals do, that part's not gonna mean anything to you. So we'll get you some of those. Um, it's especially, if you have people gardening in the desert, go ahead and plant your tomatoes like right 12 inches apart from each other and espalier them out, let them grow in a big thicket and that's fine because it never rains and you need the moisture to stay close. You need to shade the fruit that's growing so it doesn't blister in the sun. That's not our situation here. It is wet, it's messy. So you need to space the plants out, espalier them thin if you can, stake them up so that when it rains, the wind can blow through them and dry them out. 
That's really ideal because if the plant is wet, it captures, I mean, tomatoes can be so sickly and rude. Like, they're the hardest thing to grow. So, you know, don't get heartbroken if you grow a tomato and it dies. It doesn't mean you have black thumbs. You're not a real gardener unless you kill some plants. I'm sure you've heard that. Um, you know, just send me pictures, we'll figure it out. Um, but no overhead watering. And here's the thing, just put your eyes on it now and again, and if there's a problem, you can nip it in the bud really quickly. You can just like take care of it right quick and you know, before it spreads to everything else. So, um, I love that you put this in here. It was like, that is an addition <laughs> by my friend, Dr. Ashley Troth. That is hilarious. <laughs> I've never played this game. This is magic, there's some magic to, yeah. And I was like, oh, there's food stuff in there? I might need to look into that, that's so cool. At the time you play crop rotation, sacrifice a land. That's what so, I like so much about it is because it's a card that you like you get something for it, but you have to lose land for a minute to do it. Which yeah. is like exactly how crop rotation works. Mm -hmm. Like you might not get to do exactly what you want, but you get something in the future. That's so cool. I love that. So neat. Um, okay, so this is really important. So when you have a garden, divide it into separate spaces. And when you first start gardening, it's great to keep a little garden journal. Later on, you're gonna know this stuff and you're not gonna to have to write every single thing down. But, you know, you, like, if you have certain families of vegetables, you're gonna rotate those and then you won't have diseases or bugs growing right underneath and then you plant that again and again and again in the same spot. Where this is a challenge is at Briggs. I'm telling you right now, it's a heartbreaker. People try to plant the same things again and again and again. So we have to do so much integrative pest management. I don't have hardly any of the diseases or bugs at my house because I have three massive beds and I just rotate things. So I can like not pay attention to it the whole summer except for to go out and harvest. I might have to move some weeds, but there's no pickle worms and squash bugs and I don't have any of that stuff because I space my plants out and I rotate them and it makes a huge difference where at Briggs, you know, when we all come together and people are like, what are the jobs? I'm like, you and you, go and pull every brown leaf you see on a tomato and you, go spray them with copper. I have to do that like once a month just to, because I can't depend on one person to remember to do that in their own bed. And we have a lot of elders who like, can't even read the label to do that. So it's like, okay, we just maintain that as like a community crop, even though we don't pick your tomatoes. We're gonna do things you don't even know about to make sure that they stay alive. Because if I let one of them, get wrapped with disease, they're like a typhoid Mary and they just infect the entire garden. So anyway, summer's hard. <laughs> oh, you're just, you're just stretching, okay. So, yes. is there stuff that we, like if you only have the one bed, like, is there, does it make sense then to like, if you plant tomatoes one year, Yeah, there's certain things that are more disease prone and it's all the summer stuff. Like lettuce doesn't really matter. You're planting it in the fall. There's not really any bugs for it. Unless there's some fungus that gets it, then that's a problem. But like, especially when it comes to um, insects and, and fungus and things like planting again and again in the same spot is a problem. And so if you, like at Briggs, because Dolores is a plotter at Briggs, um, if I said to everybody at Briggs, and I have talked about this once, I was like, hey, how about we take a year off of tomatoes? Oh my God, people were like, I will quit. I'm not doing it. They got real <laughs> upset. I was like, okay, okay, hey, it's all right. I'm here to make everybody happy and have a good time. So we will keep growing tomatoes. But you're right. I mean, if you could give up tomatoes for a year or two and grow some cover crops, I mean, what you would get out of that would be amazing. And then if you want, I mean, you're a master gardener now, and you can do whatever you want. So, like, you can just get some pot. Like, you like, I got pots, I got soil, I got everything. Do some tomatoes in pots if you want. We can find a little spot for you to put them, and we'll label them that they're yours, and nobody will touch them. Yes? There, there, are there plots big enough to do any significant rotation, though, typically? I mean, they're not, they're not big enough to, like, for tomatoes, for instance, to, to move them to another corner of the... You know what I'm saying? So, like, if, you know... If I have three plots, I would I do tomatoes and then tomato or tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, like the year by year. Yeah, it does make a difference. No, but like like if you had a single plot, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, not really. I mean, it really it really doesn't because if people are like I'll put tomatoes here this year and then I'll put tomatoes over here this year, it, it it's not really that much of a distance, um, and it's all kind of the same soil. Plus, everybody around you 
it's sort of like, yeah, I'm going to put Milky Spore all over the place to knock down the numbers of Japanese beetles, but I'll just kill all the ones there, and then the Japanese beetles in the forest will just come over where there's no competitors and go ahead and <laughs> knock down my stuff. So it's, it, it's a balancing act. Nothing's perfect. Um, okay, so consider different seasons, designate cool season and warm season crops for each bed, and switch between groups. So, especially in the case of like solanaceae, legumes, brassicas, and cucurbits, I love that word, cucurbit. Um, and then uh, mulch is great. If you want to do mulch, I love mulch. I, the fall, I mulch, and it just basically breaks down throughout the year. And I use the oak leaves in my backyard, they're awesome. If you don't have access to leaves, people are throwing leaves away at the side of the road. Yeah. Um, try and find a friend that you know doesn't have dogs in the backyard. <laughs> okay, because uh, you don't want to just take leaves from anywhere because you, you may put poo on your stuff. So you, which is fine for like an ornamental bed doesn't matter, but it matters for vegetables. You don't want to put dog poo on. You don't want to do that. So you know if you have a friend and they blow leaves and you want it, it it's just great for a compost pile. Everything. You can also use straw. Just be really careful where you get it so you don't put that pesticide on your stuff. Um, in the fall, it doesn't really matter, though, because it won't really stunt your plants. It's the stuff in the summer. So if you do a layer of straw in the fall, it won't really affect anything unless the value is really high. And by the next year, when you put tomatoes in there, that's already broken down. So um, I don't recommend hardwood chips, though. People will try to put hardwood chips on top, and that's not a good thing to do um, because it requires so much nitrogen to break down that fresh hardwood chip that um, it actually steals nitrogen so that you, you can't use it for your plants. So. Yeah, stuff like that, or just the stuff that's at Briggs, those big piles of like chopped up when they knock down a tree and they, they chip it, that's not good to use. You can get pine bark fines, those are great to use as mulch. Um, you can get those by the truckload. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff. Some people use cardboard. Um, there's a lot of organic matter. That you, can, you know, some people will shred newspaper. Most new, like almost all newspapers now have soy-based inks, so they're safe to use. Just water them so they stick to the surface, and they're not blowing, not blowing the New York Times all around the place. There's a lot of things to do. Just make sure that you're doing something that breaks down pretty well. And then I don't recommend um, pine needles. That's great if you have alkaline soils in the western states, like if your parents had a vegetable garden and they wanted to acidify the soil a little bit, you could put that on there as mulch. But out here we already have acidic soil, so I would not use the, um, the pine needles. I'm just all numb because I just got some on Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's well, fine well. if you're doing like blueberries or something, it's fine, but for vegetables, <laughs> not. Okay, awesome. Why don't we take a break? And, uh,